Hello. hello. That's right. Usually I say hello and you say hi, Timothy. Hello. Hi. I love that. Welcome to Wearable Computing with Google. I'm going to try that clicker one more time. And I'm going to switch to the other. Something wasn't plugged in. There we are. Woo, and things work. I'm Timothy Jordan. I'm a developer advocate at Google. You can reach me online, google.com slash plus Timothy Jordan, or on Twitter, Twitter, at Timothy Jordan. Now, I'm going to cover three topics in this session. First, what is wearable computing? And I mean more than just a device that you wear. What is it at its core? I'm going to talk about how we live in a world where users have multiple devices. They're using them at the same time. And instead of ignoring that and letting them compete for each other, how do we connect those devices together into a single, seamless experience for the user? And I have an announcement in that section I think you're going to like. And then third, how can we use Google to make this whole thing a lot simpler and yet more powerful? Sound like fun? OK. So first off, what is wearable computing? You know, I keep having these conversations with developers about cool ideas right? that they have for new form factors and wearable computing and beyond. And although cool, they aren't necessarily great user experiences that solve real user problems. And let me give you an example. And I hear this idea all the time. In fact, a few of you probably have had this as well. Wouldn't it be cool if I walked into a conference and everybody I knew had a little thought bubble above them with their name and what they do and how I know them. It's not a great experience, and I'm going to tell you why. The user problem that you're trying to solve for is how do we connect people more deeply to those around them? And that's a great problem to solve. But in that solution, what you end up doing is distracting them and distancing them from the people around them. Now, there's another way to solve this. Right? What if the user had that information before walking into a business meeting? Right? They could have looked it up on their own. What if it was just delivered to them through their glass or through their Android Wear device? That's a completely different experience. In fact, you can already get it on my glass today. And what it does is it prepares that user and gives them the opportunity to connect deeply to the people around them. But the problem with the first idea is that it was built on this idea of a device. It was built on this idea of what computing is supposed to be in our future, when instead, what we should be focusing on is the user. That's the true promise of wearable computing. See, people bring technology into their lives and wear it out into the world on their adventures. And our job is to enable them to have richer experiences and be more connected to the people and world around them. Let's take a step back and examine that idea in a little bit more detail. Computers used to look like this. They filled a whole room. Shortly after that, just on your desk, and very soon after that, the palm of your hands, where you could get the full repository of human knowledge and worldwide communication just right there by reaching into your pocket. It's such a cool idea. But something that you'll notice about all of these devices is without anything else in the picture, it's hard to see the human. One of my favorite thought experiments is by this VR pioneer, Jan Lanier. Some of you have heard this before. Just please be, bear with me if you have. What if aliens came to Earth, cute, fuzzy aliens, and people were nowhere to be found, and they were trying to figure out us by looking at our computers? What would they think? I mean, do we have 102 fingers and one big eye? No, we don't. Now, if you look at a hammer, it almost makes sense. You could kind of see the arm that would wield that hammer and hammer and nails. But this computer? I mean, look at the keyboard. It's not really built for us. It's not even really built to type fast. Back when the, the keyboard layout was designed, it was designed to keep us from typing too fast so that the type bars wouldn't get caught amongst each other and screw everything up. But this is what evolved into the modern keyboard. Now, this is a very physical difference between the person and the machine. Let's look at the, something that's a little less physical, but just as dangerous. What's wrong with this picture? 
<laughs> yeah. In many ways, this is our relationship with technology. It gives us a lot of value. However, we are adapting our lifestyle to the technology that assists us. And there's a heavy cost. And we pay it frequently. How does that make sense? What if we didn't have to? And here's a photo I took a few months ago of my team playing a word guessing game. That's uh, Lindsay in the top center of the photo, and she's trying to describe a word given to her on glass. And what I love about this photo is that you can hardly see the technology. Some people think the future of computing is floating screens and constant digital overlay, constantly looking things up on the internet. They want to keep you immersed and keep you away from your life. But as it turns out with wearable computing, less is more. It's where we, as developers and designers, get to put the user before the technology. It's briefly there when you need it and not when you don't. It gives you what you need and you're back to your life. Now, this simple core philosophy to wearable computing is what you see over and over and over again in terms you hear throughout Google I.O., such as micro-interaction and glanceable information. And it's not new. It's the idea that success isn't measured by how long the user is engaged with the interface, but how quickly we can get them what they need and get them on their way. And there's a website that's been around for 15 years with that exact philosophy in mind. This kind of interaction is in our DNA. Back at the time when the search engine philosophy was keep the user on the page as long as possible, Google went in the opposite direction. And as it turns out, that's exactly what users wanted. It's exactly what they needed. And that's why it made sense for us to recognize this core philosophy in wearable computing as well. These devices are about that kind of experience. Now, that's not to say that desktops, laptops are going away. They're not. But those are, those are often tools for work, whereas these are tools for life. That's what wearable computing is. Now let's talk about connecting it all together. Remember what I said, what if the benefits of technology were available everywhere, no matter what you were doing? And this idea is bigger than just one or two devices that the user might have on them at the time. It's about all the technology that they keep in their lives. And this is what's meant by the term ubiquitous computing. And it's how we need to start thinking. It's the idea that a user starts to use a service, and it's available to them everywhere they want it to be. Now, maybe it's something as simple as an alarm clock, but it rings in whatever the context the user's in right then. Now, maybe it's in their pocket, or on their wrist, or eyewear, or in the living room, or in their car. And if you watch closely, this is where we as an industry of wearables is going, connecting all of these devices into a single seamless user experience across all of them. But how do we deal, as developers, with the complexity across this constellation of devices? Well, we do what any good engineer would do, and we simplify the problem. We need two major things, that's it. Platform components that make it easy, and a design pattern that simplifies the whole thing, or maybe patterns. Let's start with the platform. Now, for Glass, you've got the Mirror API which allows uh, you to insert timeline items and have basic user interaction. The GDK for full apps on the device with access to the hardware and advanced user interaction. On Android Wear, you can create a single app with an APK that runs on the phone and on the watch, as well as, as, well as notifications going from the phone to the watch, including some enhancements. Now, I told you I had an announcement. Glass is going to support Android Wear notifications. And this includes support for enhanced notifications and stacks and pages and replies. Uh, and it's going to be available to users on a build in the next few months. Now, this is great news for developers because it lowers the barrier of entry into the wearable space. You can build rich notifications on the phone, and they're delivered to the user wherever they are, whether that's the phone, the watch, or glass. And of course, it's great for these users. Notifications will start showing up on the wearable. And as you may know, to get this done, you don't have to do anything. They just show up. Enhanced notifications will also show on the wearable. And again, to get this done, you don't have to do anything. It just works. 
Now, Android Wear has uh, a few more features for these notifications that require just a few more lines of code. Uh, and they work on Glass just as they would work on the watch with a couple differences, right? Here's stacks. On Glass, it's bundles. Here's pages. And of course, on Glass, you're going to have the read more menu item to get to those pages. And of course, replies. They'd work the way you'd expect. So that's platform, Android Wear on Glass, bringing components together to make it easy to develop across all of these devices. Now let's talk about a design platform that simplifies the whole thing. Let's go easy, model view controller. I'm not kidding, this is great. Now this is a simple example of uh, MVC, and you could use any other design pattern here, but I'm going to show you how to spread it across devices. And it's a lot easier than you might think it is. But before I get there, who here is familiar with Model View Controller? Interesting. About 50% evenly distributed. You don't clump together. That's nice. <laughs> so this is the MVC you know and love. Let's throw the user in there as well. Um, for those of you that didn't raise your hands, this is how it works. The view is what shows the user what's going on, right? That's what they see. And maybe there's a button, and the user touches that button. That triggers the controller. The controller decides what to do. And often this means mutating some amount of data in the model. And then as that model updates, the view gets that message, and it updates in response, just around in this circle. Now, the view controller part of this, that's what your device is. Right, this is your watch, or this is your glass, or this is your phone. This is any device in the, the user's life. They're going to have a view. We need to adapt that per device. And I'll talk more about that. But it's got to be sticky. You've got to remember this part. What you design, the UI you present to the user, has got to make sense for that piece of technology that they're using. On the controller, this, can be, uh, this will be on the device. And it also is sometimes going to be spread across. And this might be in the cloud in something like App Engine, right? Where uh, once they get a response from each device, it can hold on to that context and deliver it back uh, to the user or to the view through the model. The model um, is the required like, common layer across all of these devices. In fact, there's two common layers. It's the model and the user. And they're platform agnostic, right? They can use a number of different tools to accomplish the same task. That's our goal here. And they can, we can use this model, and maybe the controller in the cloud as well, to keep context across all of those devices and deliver it to the right device at the right time. Does that make sense? This is just the MVC paradigm, except we're stretching the model and sometimes the controller across devices. Right? So we're building a client for the phone and for the watch and for glass. But then we have this um, other component that's there to help all of them. And keeping that big picture in mind is what we're going to do with an example, building all of these things on top of Google technology. We're going to make a reminder app because it's simple, right? This is a very simple. I didn't spend a lot of time designing these mocks, as you'll see. But the idea is just to think about how do we put these pieces together, right? Because this is the first time we're really doing it at this scale. And we're going to do it on these devices. And we could, of course, add in the living room or the user's car, but we'll keep it simple for now. And these are our features. The user is going to be able to set a reminder from anywhere. Right? They'll be able to receive a reminder wherever they are. And it's going to be location aware. Right? So they can set a place reminder, not just a time. Now, I'm not going to go into detail here, but let me just briefly go over these items. Uh, App Engine and Cloud Endpoints, that's what we're going to use for our cloud. Right? And there are two components that you need, some sort of structure that you can keep a controller in then if you need to, and uh, some sort of access to that model. That's Cloud Endpoints. I don't know if you've used them, but it's really easy to deploy endpoints right away and be able to mutate that model from any device that the user might be on. And then Android. We're going to use a lot of Android. We're going to use Android Wear. We're going to use the GDK. We're going to use geofencing. And we're going to use GCM to get information from the cloud onto the device. Now, here's our diagram. I went for complex, as you can see. 
Again, this is a simple example, but you can simplify this kind of service across devices. We've got App Engine up at the top, and then the user might have any of those three devices in the middle. And of course, they're at the bottom using them. Now, this is this pretty much the same diagram that I showed you earlier, right? But App Engine is the model, and then each of these devices has a view controller pair. All right, let's go through the feature set, all three of them, one by one, just to see how they're built, how these pieces are put together. To set uh, a reminder from anywhere, we need first an app on the device uh, to take the user input. So we'll start with the phone. And this is just going to be a basic Android app. It'll look a little something like this. I took my inspiration from the alarm clock, as you see. Uh, <laughs> I can add a new reminder with a name. I can add a time for that to happen at. And of course, um, I save it, and now it's on the list. I forgot one of those items. Oh, well. Now, there's a number of steps involved for that, right? Because this is a phone interface. Um, I can easily browse, and I can edit. I can do lots of things. But there's a number of steps involved in each one of those things. And that's fine. It's on our phone. But for the app on the watch and on glass, it's got to be simpler. Remember, it's a device that's micro-interaction, glanceable. I should be able to set an alarm on the go and be done. So for the watch, we're going to use a voice command. Just a simple one, OK, Google, remind me. And I speak what I want to be reminded. And for glass, OK, glass, remind me to bring my speaker notes. I did do that. And finally, we need a common place to keep all of this data. Uh, and that's the app engine with cloud endpoints. So anytime the GDK app on glass or the um, Android Wear app on the phone or on the watch uh, get a new reminder, they're going to hit that cloud endpoint, and it's going to update our model. And then that model is going to sync down to the phone via GCM so the phone always has the latest alarms. I'm going to see why in a moment why it's the phone that's keeping the, the, the reminders. To receive from anywhere, we're going to use Android Wear. <laughs> this is the simplest part. Right? We want to let the user know of the reminder. We're going to send a notification on the phone. That's why it has all the reminders on it. And then it's going to appear on the watch or glass, whatever the user has on them. You dismiss on any one of those devices, and it dismisses everywhere. OK, one last step, uh, just so you know that you can add more pieces and build onto this basic functionality, is to make it location aware. So when the user sets the reminder, we can give them an option for a particular place, like uh, remember to get the bacon salad because it was awesome next time I'm here, right? Uh, when, the, when the user sets that reminder, we'll give them that option, and then the device is going to pull GPS from somewhere. Now the watch will pull it from the phone, and from glass, uh, there's a location service that is actually pulling it from the phone. So the phone is going to keep the GPS. And then uh, it's also going to hold the geofence. So when the user enters that geofence again, then again, it will send out the reminder and it'll propagate to all the devices. What I love about this example is that each of these steps seems like they're going to be complex. But two slides later, it's simple. It's easy to do. We can set from anywhere by just having a APK on each one of these devices that can accept the data from the user and send it up to the cloud. We can receive that from anywhere by just sending a notification on the phone and relying on Android Wear to get that to the user. And it can be location aware by just attaching some GPS when we hit the cloud endpoint with that, uh, with that reminder. OK. A few things to remember, just a, a couple quick last notes. First off, this is important, too. Right? As we just talked about building something, we spent a lot of time thinking about the design just now. We would then go into development. We always kind of hope that our, our time looks like this, lots of time for development, a little bit of time for debugging at the end. You know as well as I do, it usually actually looks like this. We need a lot of time for debugging. But on wearable devices, you have a new piece of that pie, which is testing, or UX iteration. Now, you're probably doing this a lot on your applications already. But if you're not, or if you're not doing it much, for wearables, be prepared for this to be a 
large portion of your time. And the reason is because when you design a user interface or a service that goes across all these devices, you have an idea of how it will work. But you don't know for sure and you, until you try it while you're walking across the street or on the weekend at your niece's birthday party, you can't just test it sitting down at your desk in the middle of the work week. And on the same note, or a similar one at least, these devices are fundamentally different in how the user uses them. That's why you have to test. We should also think ahead of time, know that you're going to have to build a different experience. You can't just stamp out a service from the phone on glass or on a watch and just have it work the way you want it to. You have to rethink it a little bit. What is it about the watch or the glass that you couldn't do before that now you can that will come alive on these new devices? Right? We did not take the launcher and just put it on the watch, a bunch of icons. That wouldn't make sense. <laughs> right? The user can ask for things, or they can be given things. Uh, the service should flow from one device to the other, uh, because it's about the user's experience across devices, not just any one device. Because at the end of the day, we're building for people, not for technology. People outliving their dreams or having adventures, and our job is to help them have those adventures only richer and more fun. Okay, we have some documentation online. I hope you check it out. And of course, stay in this room and stay tuned to this channel for the next section, uh, or next session, Designing for Wearables. I talked a lot about a rather simple example, uh, just to describe how the pieces fit together. They're going to talk more about the design of each one of those pieces uh, to take them to the next level. Thank you very much. So I do have some time for questions, in case I answered them all, which would be OK, too. But I believe there's microphones around here. There's a, there's a microphone stand there with a droopy microphone, but it's on there. If you could go up there, that way uh, the people watching the live stream can hear your question as well. That'd be great. OK. Uh, hello. Uh, if you hello. have uh, Google Glass and Android Wear at uh, the same time, uh, what the notification would behave like? So you will get pinged on both of them, or on the Wear, or on the Glass? How are you expecting to do that? Yeah, it's a great question. And I think that there's, um, we are all just starting to explore this area. So it's a rather simple uh, action right now, is that if there's a notification on the phone, it gets sent to the wearable devices as well. Now, the nice thing about the wearable devices is it's a rather subtle notification that the user can mm -hmm. easily ignore, just a buzz on the wrist or a ding on glass. Um, and when a notification is dismissed on any of those devices, it just sort of goes away everywhere. OK, thank you. Question, <clears throat> what about uh, group not notifications? Say you, you go out hiking or biking on a group and you want to notify the group of change of plans. Is there, you know, and they're all wearing uh, a watch and they're, you know, some of them ahead of, ahead of the pack. Is there a, a group notification functionality? I'm a little unclear what you're asking. So you're saying you have multiple users, multiple phones and wear devices, right. and you want to send a notification out to all of them. Right, and maybe they're using the same app. Yeah, so this is a great example of using something like that distributed MVC model, uh -huh. only you're saving data for the group, not just the user. So then when you sync it back down to the phone via GCM, uh -huh. you're going to sync data from that group, and then all the phones will be able to push out the notification to that particular user. And everybody will get it. OK, thank you. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, I have a question more uh, towards the philosophy of wearables. Uh, we, we design apps and uh, we, we do design uh, a lot of apps in the, uh, for Android and uh, things like that. But the problem is uh, these apps I don't see being used by uh, people who are physically disabled or, uh, for example, a person who walks on the road who is blind. I don't think we are reaching to that level still. Although we have come a long way by building apps, by building the app store, etc. Now, since we are just getting started with variables, how do we ensure that we do build specifically for this set of people, how we as developers can contribute and how from your side you can ensure 
that this thing happens and it reaches to people. So I, I think what you're asking, and stay at the mic just for a moment so I, I can be sure about this, is it's really a distribution question. Once we build a service, and you're saying in particular services for disabled people, to, uh, how do we reach that audience, yes. right? Because you're having that challenge reaching that audience. Yes. And uh, this, this isn't really a new problem, and I'm not an expert on distribution, so I don't know how much I'm going to be able to help you. But uh, I would use your app stores, and I would evangelize with those communities. Okay. Thank yeah. you. Uh, thank you, team, for the presentation. Hey, you're uh, welcome. Um, so question, uh, when we use Android Wear, uh, we send a notification to a user, right? And they will see that notification, or they could see the notification in any device they have. What if we want to target a specific device? Like, we have an app in which it doesn't make sense to send a notification to the phone, but only to the watch. And you mm -hmm. don't want to send a notification to the glass as well. Yeah, so, that's a great question. So okay. right now, Android Wear uh, sends the notification out to whatever uh, wearable that the user is using. So if they're using multiple wearables, it'll go to all of them. Uh, the nice thing about the notifications is that they're relatively easy to ignore, so you can kind of just pay attention to where your attention is. Um, however, uh, there are ways where you can have a notification just on a device. If that's really important to your service and you want to build it today, when you build, even in this example, you've got a GDK app and you've got an APK on the Android Wear app that's on the watch. And both of those can communicate to the phone and deliver notifications to the user directly rather than using the Android Wear notification service. In that case, you'd be able to choose which device you want to have the notification and which you don't. Okay, makes sense. Uh, second question, very second quickly. Second question, I'm, I'm, yeah, it's I'm, fine. So, sorry. Uh, so for Glass now, we have initially the Mirror API, then we have the GDK, and now, uh, happily, we're going to have the Android Wear. Mm -hmm. um, so is like the three platforms or the three ways of developing apps are going to be available for Glass in the future, or should we expect to just focus on Android Wear and neglect the others? Or what, what's going to be like the preferred way of developing for Glass? So I will give you a general answer and a specific answer. And a general answer, this applies to this question, any other sort of what's going to happen in the future question. As a policy, I don't I comment understand. on anything understand. that might happen yep. in the future. So uh, uh, there's some difficulty there. But what I can tell you is that the engineering and design teams for both Android Wear and Glass work very closely together. And our goal is for all of this stuff to work really well together. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, what happens with persistent notifications? on where? Like say, for instance, you have a battery notifier in your notification bar, or some weather apps have weather, or what have you. You know, I don't know the answer to that offhand. There is a more deeply technical session on Android Wear where you could ask some specific questions like that tomorrow. Um, uh, Android Wear from the developer's perspective. Or if you ask me online later, I'll, I'll look up the answer for you. Thanks. Yeah. Beyond the basic uh, interface, what kind of opportunities will there be to fully customize the screen for wearables? That's a great question. So um, again, in this example, it was simple, right? However, uh, the GDK app and again, the APK on the um, Android Wear app for the watch uh, are both code running on the device and both allow you to do full screen UIs that are fully custom. Okay. Um, the new. Uh the new devices for Android Wear, they, they introduce uh, uh, new uh, possibilities of interaction. So um, do you have anything regarding uh, gesture uh, recognition? So like, let's say recognizing the user is looking at, at, at the watch or something of that sort, like lifting the arm and looking at it or doing other type of gestures with, with the hand. Is that something that? Uh, so there is some of that built in. And as you heard in the keynote earlier, that most of the APIs in Android are also available for the app that you build that runs on the wearable. So there's a lot of that stuff that you can do already. Um, but stay tuned for some more examples where we can examine that in more detail. Thanks. So sort of expanding on that point, how do you see uh, gestures and voice recognition uh, working together or commingling in uh, sort of a, a unified experience? Well, that's a great question as well. Uh, it's interesting that, um, and you should definitely stay for the uh, designing section next, so they'll go in a little bit more detail about this, right? Different situations work well for each of those instances. Sometimes just being able to say something really quick, like remind me to, makes sense. Like right? trying to input that through a gesture wouldn't make sense. Right. But then on the other hand, you'll notice when you get a phone call, just swiping across the screen is really the right thing to do for a, a, a watch, right? Yeah. 
on glass, you can do it through gesture or through voice. So in many ways, you're giving the user the option. Uh, and in other cases, there is sort of a clear winner. Um, there are sort of gotchas in each case. Right? So for example, if you're using head gestures um, and the user happens to be walking somewhere, yep. there's certain head gestures that work better than others. So for example, looking up and then looking down works pretty good, but like trying to scroll a list or <laughs> scroll a list horizontally would right. be more difficult. So those are the kinds of things you need to think, yep. uh, think about, but all of those will become apparent as soon as you test it in different situations. Yeah. And uh, do you see any implication or uh, uh, expansion to context-aware gestures? So you. You have a essentially a, ge a gesture set uh, to your specific location or in your environment, so that those similar movements mean different things in different uh, scenarios or uh, spaces. I think that sounds very cool, and that you should definitely explore that with the platform. Okay, yeah, come yeah. talk to me after. Uh, hi, Timothy. Uh, great talk. Very excited about Android Wear coming to Glass. Um, so, Ooh. a question. Up to this point, uh, the timeline has sort of been a, a chronology. Um, and sort of the cards that are to the left of the home screen have sort of been um, up and coming things. So mm -hmm. Android Wear uh, notifications, at least how they've been shown on watches, is, is kind of things that kind of you see once and then uh, dismiss, which is a little different than the current uh, paradigm for uh, glass timeline cards. Um, they don't really get to dismiss unless um, you actually go through and, and uh, delete them. So I guess I'm kind of wondering, is this a sort of changing the purpose of the timeline in a way? Um, or how do you see that? that uh, changing or being the same in terms of you know, the interaction with these cards? Yeah. So I'm going to give you that sort of same general answer before, but again, two more specific ones. General, like I, I can't really talk about how this is going to change in the future. Um, a specific one is uh, you know, the four guys are going to be on the stage in the next session. They're designers from teams of both Android Wear and Glass. They might have some more insight. Um, another specific answer I'll give you is that when you do get an Android Wear notification on Glass, it will always include a dismiss menu item. OK, great, thanks. Yeah. Hi, Timoth Hi Timothy. Um, I had a question. You were talking about um, the kind of maintaining a similar experience across different types of wearable devices. And mm -hmm. um, so you know, with Glass and upcoming with Wear, we're working with both gestures and uh, voice control. Do you see in the future with the new wearable devices those kind of maintain, re remaining the predominant form of interaction with your device? Or do you see maybe in the future we might have different ways of, uh, of interacting or focusing around the same thing? Yeah, I mean, if I'm doing the hand wavy, what do I think you know, wearable computing is all about? I, I, I think all those things are important. I also think context is really important, where the user is, what they're doing right now, what they're doing next, um, and sometimes almost as important as you know, when they invoke a voice command. Sure. All right. Thank you very much. Welcome. So after Google Glass support uh, Android Wear notification, uh, is, is, is Mirai API still supported? Uh, and do you think it, they conflict, or it, is it still useful? I don't think any of these things conflict. We're one big happy family. Um, <laughs> And uh, you know, Mirror API is, is certainly alive and well, and there's glassware that I'm running today that, that use it that I think are great for it. So for example, New York Times uses the Mirror API. So does CNN. And just for sending a timeline item to glass, it's really a stellar experience. How this stuff over, evolves over time, again, you know, I can't really speak to the future. Uh, but we're always going to want to make this stuff work better and better with each other. Thank you very much. Yeah. Hi, Tim. Uh, first of all, awesome session. Uh, Thank you. So uh, uh, for uh, there are two questions actually. The first one is uh, the app discovery in the in the wearable. Mm -hmm. So like right now in and, uh, in any phone we go and have the grids of apps. So like would the app discovery be more context aware or like uh, like user can just still go through like maybe smaller grids or mm -hmm. different stuff of app discovery in the in, in the wearable. You know, that's a really great question. And you saw that slide where I had sort of the, the launcher on the phone and the yeah. launcher on the watch. Yeah. Like, that doesn't make sense. That's true. Um, and both uh, the Glass UX team and the Android Wear team went away from the launcher, right? Sort okay. of like this post-grid philosophy, if you will, no grid right. of icons. Um, when the user wants to do something, when they want to start an action, they use a voice command. Right, or they select right. that command from the, the voice command touch menu. Uh -huh. um, and they're, they're, they're sort of given contextually aware cards uh, about information that makes sense to them then and at that moment. So you're exactly right that the launcher is going away. And the, sort of the, the base philosophy in there is that what if we could reduce almost to nothing the time between intent and action? A launcher implies like I, I take out something, and I look through stuff, and I pick one. 
Whereas when I say, OK, Glass, get directions to the Museum of Modern Art, it's done. Right, right. So I mean, uh, the reason of that question was like uh, sometimes you know even on mobile uh, you have so many of apps. Mm -hmm. So at at one point uh, there would be in Glassware too like y user would have too many things that they think useful at times, but they tend to forget that like was it already there? So like every time giving a single command and like browsing through it's it's uh, kind yeah. of pain. Well, and, and that's, of course, uh, against that philosophy that I was talking yeah. about earlier, which is, what if we can make all this simpler? What if we could give the user all the value from technology, I but see. with none of the fuss? I so I don't think our goal is to fill the watch with lots of you know, different things that they may someday want to do, I but see. to give them the experiences that they need to do today. Cool, thanks. Yeah. And the second question is, uh, for now, uh, it's more adding to the design questions previous folks had, is that, uh, uh, there are guidelines for Android uh, app design, like mm -hmm. navbar and six-pack designs and stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, is Android going to come up with the suggest suggested design? And like, there are of course anti-design patterns. So, uh, are, are there any uh, you know uh, design patterns to look forward for the variables, or like as of now, you, uh, developers kind of and designer have to Absolutely. figure it out? There are design guidelines available for both Glass and Android Wear, and you'll find I that see. they're very similar. Um, and they give you a lot of information, in fact, a very clear roadmap of where to go with your design. So I'd look for that on both the developer documentation for each of those. In fact, let me go back one slide just so you can remember what those URLs are. If you add a slash design, I think, to either one of these, but I know for Glass, it'll okay. take you to the design page. Awesome, awesome. Well, thanks yeah. a lot. You're Cheers. welcome. So uh, I could imagine uh, many apps wanting to implement uh, wearable notifications. Is there going to be a central place that a user can uh, subscribe and unsubscribe to notifications? Uh, or is it on a per app basis? And is there any way to prioritize notifications so that they get the most important ones first? So what will be available uh, when you get your Android Wear device up and running is that when you have the companion app on the phone, you can choose any application that you want to mute. There's certainly a lot further we could go with there. Um, we'll just have to see what the future holds. Thank you. Yeah. Hi. Um, based on your uh, example for the reminder and stuff, if I don't have the phone with me, will it be able to create an application that uses only the, um, the wearable device that holds information in it and present or communicate even with other devices than the phone? Yeah, that's a good question. So for the Android Wear notifications, that requires the phone, because that's yeah, yeah. where the notifications are coming from. But if you have the Android Wear app, Right, which is an APK on the phone and an APK on the watch, that would work on the watch even in absence of the phone. And, right? and you'd want to build your service in such a way that like, you'd still have that capability if you yeah, wanted it. And like, connect the, the watch with other devices other than the phone? Um, I don't know that offhand. You'll have to stay tuned for that. Right, thanks. Yeah. So from a user's perspective, it seems like there's a lot of overlap and redundancy in functionality between Glass devices and where, uh, you know, the Android Wear devices uh, mm -hmm. that we've seen so far. Um, is the expectation that the user is typically going to have one or the other, or do we expect both of them to kind of work together in a lot of cases? Gosh, I don't know. You know, I mean, uh, we do a lot of building these things for users, but then we get to learn how they're going to use them when they actually get their hands on them. Uh, so we're going to have to find out. Um, I think with wearable technology, one of the things that we start to learn is once you do sort of put the human in that picture, right, it, there's a lot of personal preferences involved. Right? So we're just going to have to see uh, how that plays out. Thank you. Yeah. I have two quick questions. Mm -hmm. um, the first, you had talked about um, apps on the wearable communicating with the phone. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is apparently structures for that in Android Wear. There's nothing like that on Glass at the moment. Can we expect or request that sort of uh, a data interchange platform? So there is a way for you to exchange data over Bluetooth between Glass mm. and the phone. But you have but to roll is... your own, basically. Yeah, yeah it's not simple. Right. Um, uh, as far as a feature that we'd release in the future, of course, again, I can't like comment sure. on that. Sure. Okay. Uh, but I can Consider say that I've heard this feedback, then. and I definitely appreciate okay. the feedback. Thank you. Uh, um, second, very quick question: What okay. happened to your hat? <laughs> I, uh, I left it. Okay. I, uh, I can't be the only one wondering. <laughs> Thanks. Some days are hat days, and some days are hatless days, I suppose. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs>
Um, notifications uh, with media style allow you to like play and pause things through notifications like in an app, right? Uh -huh. I was curious, is there any limitation with an API or anything that stops you from building buttons that do other things? That's a great question. I don't know the answer offhand. I'm sorry. Okay. I, what I can tell you is that uh, when you play or pause and you have that notification on your phone, it, it automatically just shows up that way on right. the Wear device. So if, if there is a way, then that likely would as well. OK, thanks. Yeah. Is there a left eye version of the Google Glass for people who are weak in the right eye? <laughs> and this is the last question that we yes. have. Uh, no, no, Glass is only available on the, the right eye version. OK. And yeah. there is another question is, I don't want to carry my phone around everywhere. I, that? I don't want to carry the phone, the Android phone, everywhere. OK. I just want to carry my watch and probably the Google Glass. OK. Because <laughs> so is there a way it, things can work? with just this two? Well, both those devices yeah. still work in absence of a phone. Mm -hmm. What doesn't work is the notification service, which is relaying from the phone to those devices. So when the phone's not around, it, of course, won't do that. But again, remember that on both these devices, you can put APKs on them that can run code on that device and work in offline mode. So for example, with Glass, one of my favorite glassware is WordLens. And it does like translations right in front of you right, of uh, whatever you're looking at. And that works without an internet connection and without the phone being present. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you all so much for coming. I really appreciate it.